Howdy guys, this is IndiePixel, and I am happy to bring the fourth video in the Intro to Vex series. Alright, so in this particular video, we are going to talk about raycasting. Alright, and then we're going to look at a way to do selection based off of the number of objects that you have and a bunch of points. Alright, so these are two methods that I use quite often uh, in my workflows every day, so I just wanted to cover them because they're super useful. And I also just wanted to talk about why they're so useful. Okay, so let's get started. What I'm going to do first is talk about the ray casting over here. So I'm going to drop down a geometry node, like so. I'm going to delete that file node that always comes with it. And I'm going to show my properties up here on my parameters pane. All right, so the first thing that we need is a line. So I'm just going to drop down a line. I'm not going to actually make a line from scratch this time. So I'm going to then point that in the Z direction. Now you don't necessarily have to do this. I'm just doing this for example uh, purposes here. So I just want this to lay down flat because I'm going to project this line onto a grid. Okay. So then I'm going to move it back in the Z direction. So it's centered over the world center. So I'm just going to grab that Z direction parameter. And also need to make sure that I multiply that there. And then move it back with the negative sign. So now we're centered right over that middle area right there. Okay. And what I want to do now is add some more points. And I want to create a grid. Now this grid is going to be the object that we're going to snap onto. Okay. And to prove that, I don't want to just have any flat grid. Because that wouldn't really prove anything. Because our line is also already flat right here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is um, drop down the size to something like 2 by 2. And we'll leave the rows and columns the same. I'm going to just make this dependent on the rows there. Okay, and then I'm going to drop down a mountain sop. All right, and that'll just perturb it a little bit. That way we actually have something that's a little bit more like terrain. Now, I do use this technique quite often with terrains because let's say I want to lay down a road onto the terrain. Um, this is a great way to do that. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of a world grid there and turn off these point numbers like that. Okay, so now we have a grid and we have a line. And what I want to do is first transform this line above that grid. So to do that, all I need to do, let's just put this on template like so. All I need to do is actually move this line to the max, to the Y max of the bounding box of this grid. So I'm going to take this translate or the transform node here and just type in the BB box function and give it the grid object to process. And I want the DY max. And that should have done it. We need the mountain actually, not the grid, because the grid itself is flat. So we want the mountain. There we go. All right, so what that does is put that right above the top. And you can always add a little bit extra. might help, like 0.1. So now you can be assured that this line is always above that grid, like so. Okay? And so what I want to do now is write some vex that will actually cast some rays down onto this grid right here and snap the line to wherever it hits the grid. And if it doesn't hit the grid, it shouldn't do anything. So let's do that. So I'm going to drop down a wrangle node. We need the point wrangle. All right. And I'm going to feed the line into the first input and the mountain into the second input. All right. Because what we're going to do is we're going to use the second input to use as the processing, the geometry that we're going to process. Okay. And we're going to apply the modifications to the line. All right. So the first thing that we need to do is figure out how we're going to cast a ray. So inside of VEX, we actually have a function called intersect. And this basically will cast a ray given by a direction from a certain point onto another piece of geometry. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to take advantage. I'm going to be using this particular function right here. And you'll notice that there are these weird arguments here at the end of this intersect. So if you're familiar with something like C-sharp, this is basically like a, an out type of argument or a reference type of argument. 
if you feed in a variable, it'll output the result of this function into that particular variable. And so that's what this little and means. Okay, so we need to set up a those particular variables, and we also need to set up a couple other variables like this direction. Okay, so let's do that. So what I want to do is I want to type out int. We're going to say um, primnum, okay, because once again, let me cover that really quick. Because if we come down here, what this says, it says this function computes the intersection of the specified ray with the geometry. And the primitive number is returned, or negative 1 if there was no intersection found or there was an error. So we're basically going to be getting the primitive number of this. So, let's, so it's going to return whatever primitive we hit, or negative 1 if it didn't hit anything. Okay, so knowing that, what we can do is store this primnum. So I'm just going to call the variable primnum, and it equals intersect. And let's go take a look at the next argument here. So we need a file name or an input. So we can input a file, or we can input the geometry that we want to intersect against. So in this case, the geometry that we want to intersect is coming into the input 1. So I'm just going to put a 1 right there. And then I want to provide it an origin. In this case, it's just going to be the current point that we're on in the line. So we're going to utilize the position of these points. So I'm just going to say at P because that's a vector. And that gives us that position of that point that we're currently on because we are running over points. So, so for each point, we're running this operation. So then the next argument here is the direction. Okay. And we can always expose this. So we can say um, vector hitter, or you can call it whatever you want, is equal to, uh, we'll just say, actually, we'll make this a property or a parameter. We're going to call this hitter, like so, and make sure that it's a vector. Okay, and then let's create that. So now we have a hit. A hit there so I can do a negative 10 in this case so it's pointing straight down 10 units all right so I'm going to provide that hit there here and then the next argument is those two values so we have the origin and we have the direction that we want to ray cast in and now I want to store the result of that so I want to store the position that we hit and I want to store the UVW or the the UV position of that because we're going to use that to get the, the normal from the primitive as well. Okay, so let's go back and do that. So I need to create two variables here and they're both going to be vectors. So we're going to say vector is going to be hit point. Okay, and we're going to call that, oh, we don't need to call it anything actually. Then we need another vector and we're going to call this UVW. Okay. So we're going to provide those two parameters, UVW. All right. And so what's going to happen is that hit position is going to be stored now in this hit point so we can use it later. And we're also going to get the UV position that we hit at. So very useful information when dealing with primitives. So what we can do now is we can say if the primnum is greater than zero because remember if it fails all right actually we can say greater than or equal because we could ha we could be hitting the primitive zero but if it's negative one then it failed and let's not run any of this code let's just leave the point where it's at so what we can say then is that the at p is equal to the hit point because that hit position is being stored in that reference variable and there you go we are now snapped to the geometry perfectly. See, not too hard. And this runs super fast, way faster than doing it through a point bop. So if I were to offset this, you can see that, I mean, this is a very basic example, but when you start dealing with large trains and like roads and stuff like that, or train tracks, this is a very fast technique and it works well with the Houdini engine as well. So, um, the other ways that you would do it that are really slow, the, slow, the slowest way would be to use the race op, 
right? And you can snap these guys down like so. And you actually need to provide it a normal, right? So you have to give it a point here. And we'll do a normal like so. And we just say set. Oops. So set zero, negative ten, zero. There you go. All right, so that's the slower way to do it. And then you can do it in a point bop. Okay. So we jump in here and we drop down the intersect node. All right, and it's, you can see it's looking for the same information. So the file that we want to intersect against is going to be from op input two in this case. The array or origin is the current point position that we're on. And then we need a constant, or you could make a parameter as well. But in this case, I'm just going to make a constant because I don't need to expose this for, these, for this particular demonstration. All right, so I'm going to pass that into the raider, and then the new pause is going to be that, and you get the, the same sort of snapping. So three different ways you could do the snapping. Uh, I do prefer the point wrangle. And the more and more you become familiar with VEX, you'll find yourself just using the wrangle nodes mostly, because this starts adding complexity to your graphs. And while it's easy and visual, uh, it just makes your graphs explode <laughs> into complexity and just a ton of nodes everywhere. So I still just wanted to show those other ways of doing that because there are three ways. Well, there's probably more, but there's those are the three more common ways to do this particular technique. OK, so the last thing I want to do is actually provide the normals from our hit point, right? Because currently, we don't have any normals. And that's, that is no good. So what we want to do is just drop down a normal, like so, so that way we can actually create normals, OK? And what I'm going to do is actually put this, I, ha I have to put this onto primitives. That way, we are actually pulling in the normal from the primitive. So these are the, pr the normals that we're going to extract, basically. OK? So let's go back to our wrangle node here, and let's get that done. So what we want to do is utilize the prim function. This allows us to access attributes. So if I were to type in prim here, go to that vex function for it. So what it's looking for is the geometry, okay, or the op input. So in this case, it's just going to be one, okay, and the string attribute name. So in this case, it's going to be n, and then the primitive that we hit. Now remember, the current prim num is being stored or given to us by this intersect function. So this is going to be super easy. So all we need to do now is just say at n equals prim 1. We want to pull the normal out, and we want to give it that prim num that we just hit. Because remember, if we don't hit anything, none of this stuff's going to run, and we wouldn't have any information to pull out anyway. So there you go. And now we have the normals. So we've extracted those guys off of the geometry that we hit off of that grid. All right, so that is what I wanted to show there. Super useful technique, comes in handy all the time. And now, obviously, the terrain and roads example is the, the more common and more obvious one. I just use that quite often. You can use this for anything that you need to snap one, one object to another. So definitely keep this one in your toolbox. OK. So moving on, let's go and do the selection. So the selection example here, let's take a look at this guy. So the selection allows us to provide a bunch of points, OK? And then create IDs on each of those points. So if we come down here, you can see that I randomly assign some IDs to these points. And I can change those IDs. As, as I see fit, I can also change their seed value so we get different selection types. 
right? But what it's really doing is it's going through and it's picking particular objects here from, from that object ID and using that piece of geometry. So we're just using a switch node to select between a bunch of different objects. Now imagine that you wanted to scatter rocks along the terrain, okay? And you have three different models of rocks that have been provided to you by an artist, or maybe you created a rock maker node inside of Houdini, and every single time you want to basically select a different type of rock. You don't want to just stamp the same rock over all the points and then just randomly rotate them because it's going to look kind of obvious. So you might as well sl switch and select between three different types of rocks or five different types of rocks, how many ever types of rocks you want. So this is what we're going to do now, okay? So let's create a new node. So I'm going to do geometry. <coughs> Delete that file. What I want to do is create a circle in this case. Okay, so imagine that we have a plot of land that we want to scatter points onto. I'm going to actually make that into a polygon and reverse it. All right, cool. And then what I want to do is give this some normals, but I want normals that are radiating out from the center. And so what I want to do is select normal and then just type in at P. And you'll notice that all of our normals are now radiating outwards. And then th this is useful because then I can use the mountain stop to create different shapes on that plot, just to create random shapes out of that circle. Nice, quick, and easy, cheap randomization or procedural thing to get different looks. Okay, and then on that particular plot, I'm going to scatter some points like so, and definitely change that ray count. We don't need as many. Okay, so now we have our points. And what I want to do is I want to create an ID for each one of these points, and I want it to be random. Okay, so I'm going to drop down a wrangle node, like so. In this case, an attribute wrangle node. All right, and what I want to do is, it's really simple. What I want to do is first create a float called seed. And this is going to be our seed value. Just so it'll allow us to change the randomization. And then I want to give an int called obj count. And this is going to be chi object count. And that's going to allow us to tell how many objects we want to select from. Okay? And then the final property or the attribute that we're going to put on each one of these points is just going to be a fit01 with a random function. Okay, So let's do an i at because this is going to be an attribute, not a variable. These are variables. This is going to be an attribute that sits on the point. And we're going to call this obj id. And that's going to be equal to a fit01 and a random function. And in that random function we're going to provide the current point number times our seed value so we can change the randomness. And now this random function will return us a value from 0 to 1. So what we want to do is we want to fit it between a new range. And that's going to be 0 to that object count. All right. And with that, you can see that we don't have any, we just have 0 for our OBJ ID over here. And that's because we need to create the channels over here. So I'm going to increase my seed and increase the object count. And you can start to see that we are getting just random selection. Okay, So these values are actually on these points. And so what we can do is we can go and use those values with a copy stamp. Or at least that's what I usually do. So let me create uh, a box. Okay, I'm going to create a sphere. And I'm going to create a tube. And I'm going to scale all these guys down. So I just want to check their sizes here. I need the grid for this. So for this cube, I'm going to put it down to something like that. And for our sphere, I'm going to pull that down to about the same size as that box. And then the same for this tube. Pull down the height a little bit. There we go. <coughs> And then what we want to do is 
give us a way to select which one we should be using. So I'm going to drop down a switch node and I'm going to put the box in for the zero input, the sphere in for the one input, the ID of one, and then a tube for the second input. And now what I can do is I can use that switch to select which object I want to use for a particular point. Let me turn all these guys off here. Okay. So what we can do now is use a copy stamp node. Now this is what I do. Um, you could probably use the copy two points and just pass the attribute. Um, but I need to look into that. <coughs> okay. So with this copy stamp node, let's go into stamp. We'll stamp the inputs. And we're going to create a new variable called uh, object ID. And we are just going to utilize this OBJ ID in here. So all you need to do is just put in at OBJ ID. Now with that, we can go and utilize a stamp function up here. So stamp, give it the node or the copy node that we want. So in this case, we just have the one. So it's just copy one. We want to get the variable name off of that, object ID, and then the default. And you can see now we're getting a box and tubes and a sphere. And now the tubes are oriented along the Z because remember that when we copy something to a point using any of these copy nodes, it uses the Z direction to orient the tube. So I want to point this in Z and that'll make the tube sit up appropriately. And so with that we're done, we can go and change the seed value and change the object count number so we can get to all cubes. Now we have mostly cylinders or get a nice mix of the, of the three. Tubes, spheres, and cubes. Top quality CG right there. <laughs> Anyways, it's a cool technique and it really comes in handy when you start to place things into a level using Houdini. Uh, without having to hand place things and make it look random, you can use this technique to place anything from floor tiles to plants, um, tons of things. Yeah, a good example is if you have like a sci-fi corridor, you can use this as a way to randomize which modular piece you want to use for the walls or the floor or the ceiling, those kinds of things. All right, so that's what I wanted to show today. Hopefully you guys like that. Thanks again for subscribing, and I will talk to you guys in part five.